So check this out. We're still we're still in the uh, the Hanani outreach series that I've been doing now for I'm not sure how long. <clears throat> anyway, we just kind of landed on this. In fact, this was all put together like last week sometime or something like that. And it just happened to land on this particular day. And it's, it's called Outreach Serving Our Way In. And it just happened to land on probably one of the most successful outreaches we have had. I mean, you know, we had the pandemic and stuff like that. We've had some pretty successful outreaches. But that one today was amazing. Who was up on the mountain with me today? Oh, let's give them a hand. They are the mountain warriors. I am telling you, it was on from before it even started. It was people were showing up and getting prayer. Conversations were happening and prayer for everything you can imagine was going on up on that mountain there. There was a lot of happy faces, lots of laughter. It was just like a joy overload up on that mountain up there. And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about what the world sees, in particular the lost world, not necessarily the negative, you know, I hate Christian kind of people, but those that are just kind of, you know, somewhere, whether it be at an event like we had today or whether it be in the market or, you know, even at home or on the dreaded Thanksgiving, the joy that, that we have, the genuine joy that we have because of our faith in Christ, it, it, shines man and that's what was happening up on that mountain up there i watched as you know all of our our people the jesus freaks were doing their thing man doing the roadhouse freak show and there was prayer over here and laughter over here and all kinds of fun stuff happening at the table and i was watching people man because i was kind of standing in the back and people were kind of you know walking by or, or or they were off a little bit and they would all turn around they were looking because first they heard what was going on and then they saw the happiness and the joy and they would kind of meander back over there and then you know when they get close enough like a venus flytrap you know and we'd snatch them up real quick and and draw them in like dangle uh, keychains in front of them and whatnot you know they they were drawn to the energy man and it was positive and it was happy and it was joyful and this is how it, this is how it opens up tonight non-believers judge us by what we do not what we say we believe They've heard it all before. Most of the time, people have already heard everybody's beliefs on this. And, and to, be, to be honest with you, usually it's a pretty negative thing, you know, what we believe. And it comes across as, if you don't believe what I believe, then you're lesser in some way. You're, you're, not, you're not like us. You're not part of our club. And, and it, can be, it can be a real drag. And I've experienced it, and probably some of you have experienced that too. But when it comes to people looking at us as Christians, I mean, there's always, almost always a preconceived notion of judgment that if they approach or they get too close, you know, the fingers are start going to be getting pointed and they're going to have to get lectures on how they should do this or how they shouldn't do that or whatever. But when the narrative is changed to happiness and joy, especially coming out of something as destructive as COVID and all the junk that everybody dealt with there, I'm telling you, man, people are hungry for happiness right now and joy and laughter the, we're we're just inundated with junk man you know whether it's mixed messages on things and diseases and shots and whatnot or just the over ridiculously hyper political environment that we're living in people are sick to their necks of it man we've learned more about politics than probably any of us ever wanted to in our entire lives so when they see, and when I say happiness, it's not like some lunatic laughing over in the corner and drooling and stuff like that. It's true joy, man. People are happy and laughing, and it emanates outward, and it draws people in. And once they're in there, you know, I even watch people, like, you know, stepping up because there's laughter, and they, like, take a few steps back and look up at our banner, and a few of them, like, sinners, welcome. And, you know, it was kind of like, uh, oh, boy, you know, I just walked into a minefield. But then all the, the spinner people, you know, start doing their thing. Patrick rocked it. He's not here right now, but he was like, uh, you know, you, I know I come across occasionally as Willy Wonka-ish. Well, he was really like the cat in the hat dude going out there and just having such a good time, man. He was just in his element. We kind of had to 
reel him in, man, is he was so excited. He was chasing people down and down the aisle and stuff. Like, bro, oh, come here, man. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's scary because you're big and you're hairy, you know, and uh, people don't know how to react to that stuff. So they saw something today. I don't even know how many hundred. I have no idea. There's no way I can keep count. We'll we'll probably know when we look at the spinner cards. It was packed, man. You know, even before the event started, there was 20 or 30 cards already in the little the little bucket we put our cards in when people come by, and that was just people from the shows. And it was so cool. The conversations that were happening were so random and sad and happy and joyful. And people were praying. You know, one dude was praying he needed to pass a test. An older guy was he needed to pass some electrician's test, and he put his trust in God right there, man. And he, he clearly wasn't a believer yet, but, but he was feeling it, man. And so he's like, yeah, let's pray for that. It was just kind of everything that I love about outreach, man. It was just positive, powerful, and our people rocked it, man. I mean, from the beginning, I, I, I had to bail out around 1.30 or so, but everyone, you know, stayed in the fight and until it was over. I don't know, man. I got to tell you, when these things come up like that, the happy tours... And, I, and I'm not trying to push for people to come and serve. I'm trying to share with you guys, you're missing out on some really cool stuff, man. And I know everybody's got important things to do. I know Dr. Phil's on and Get Smart and whatnot, stuff like that. But when you're out there serving and you start getting like drawn into all the, the joy and happiness and the energy that's just happening right there, I, you know, I know we all got stuff going on in our lives, man, because, like, who doesn't, right? But for a period of time, man, the Holy Spirit has a way of moving that stuff over here and just focusing you in on Him, man. And I got to tell you, I I've, believe it or not, this is kind of, you know, you're going to be like a what moment. But I've taken a lot of drugs in my life, and right? I know, right? But there ain't no high like the most high. I'm telling you, man, there ain't nothing like getting high on the Holy Spirit. It is the absolute bomb, man. Anyway, so knowing that they, what they see is their first impression of us, right? And you can say anything you want about the gospel. You can tell them anything you want about your biblical beliefs and stuff like that. And nine out of ten times, they're just hearing Charlie Brown's teacher. Blah, 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 blah. But... With what they see with their own eyes is something different. And it doesn't click right away in their brain. They kind of look up at sinners, welcome. These are Christians. And they look back at all the laughter and the fun. And they look back up and they're like, oh, this isn't really what I expected. And then as they go through the process, man, they meet different people each time. you know. And by the time they get out to the other side and the prayer, they, you can see that they're happy, they're smiling, you know, who knows if they just really enjoyed the prayer, they were happy, they felt touched by it, or if they were just going, that was a real trip right there. I did not expect that to happen. So, let's start off with the first fill-in. Well, let me, let me pray it. Father, we thank you today. First, Lord, we thank you for your word again, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit continuing to guide us. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for that amazing mountaintop experience that we had up there today, Lord. Man, we just dig that stuff, Father, and we thank you for opening up all these opportunities, even in the chaos that was amongst all that, Lord, you still showed up and made everything just such an amazing day for all of us and all of them. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for showing up. We thank you for leading us up there, and we thank you for being there with you. And tonight, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for the message you have for each of us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here's the first villain. Serving for them to see Jesus. As we're going through the evangelist thing, remember we're talking about outreach and stuff like that, and, and I think I pretty much established that agendas are kind of off the table, right? And there's always kind of a, an agenda, but sometimes we can get too lasered in on it, and we get tunnel vision, man, and then it comes off generally more as judgmental and combative even. So in light of what I saw up on the mountain today, everybody that was there today absolutely served so that they could see Jesus. Whether you know it or not, that's what you were doing today. You were letting them see the joy of your salvation. It was something cool for them to see. And so look at 1 Peter with me real quick. 
1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. I love this verse right here because this is like dad bragging on us, man. He says, each and every one of you are chosen. It's not a mistake. You're not a mistake. You've never been a mistake. The things that have happened in our lives, God knows about every single one of those, and he has a crazy unique way of using even the worst of situations to benefit himself and others out there. Even though we might still carry the scars of them, there's still people out there that benefit because he chose us even out of that darkness. And he says, you're a royal priesthood, all of you. Oh, wait, you're the pastor. Yeah, I, I realize that. But we are a chosen, a royal priesthood. We are part of something special, man. We're part of the kingdom of God. And all of you, including myself, are kingdom kids, man. We're children of the Most High God. And he says we're a holy nation, man. And we took that a little chunk of our holy nation up on that mountain today, and we showed I don't know how many people, two or three hundred, maybe. There's probably more than that, man. There was just so many people. And we showed them that side of a holy nation, that joyful, happy, exciting, fun, alive, man, and not dead and locked down somewhere behind a mask or whatever. They saw something up on that mountain today that sparked interest in them. And their hearts were open to it. And the Holy Spirit just came rushing in. And look what he says here. That you, his own special people. Incidentally, there's some other um, versions of this that, that refer to us as peculiar. And I always thought that one fit us just perfectly. Actually, well, you guys for the most part. Anyway, he says, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Our testimony. Now, all that laughter that was going on there today up at the, with the battle wagon, the booth and stuff like that, none of those people know that many of the people that were serving up there today have got some horror stories to tell of their life and what they've survived. They would never have been able to, to just look at someone and guess that they'd lived a destructive, dark life, man, the things that happen to them that are unspeakable because that joy of Jesus, man, has a way of pushing that stuff to where it needs to be. We're in dad's capable hands and just release that joyful, saved person up on that mountain. All they saw was happiness. And I don't think people are stupid. I think people understand that everybody's got stories to tell. And probably everybody on that mountain I would almost guarantee that everybody in that mountain has suffered something through COVID. At, at, least, at least something, whether it was an illness, a loss of a family member, financial, whatever it was. And to look at us, they're smart enough to know that all of us also went through 2020 as well. So if we're able to have that kind of joy and happiness and excitement and life, just life, man. And I'm not just talking about having a pulse, man. I'm talking about being alive, man. When, the, when you look at someone that's alive, it's, it's attractive, man. And it draws people to that. And that's what they saw in that mountain. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Now, real quick, that whole sojourner thing is a person that resides temporarily in a place. That's what a sojourner is, the definition of it. Someone that goes somewhere, not for the purpose of staying there forever, but going there temporarily for a purpose. And that's exactly the definition of outreach. We certainly didn't go to Quaid to like, you know, set up shop and live there forever. Um, I don't know why anybody would go and live on that mountain forever, like in terms of winter time and stuff like that. That's just, there's something fundamentally off a little bit, but that's okay. I still love those of us, the people that live up on the mountain there. I'm sure there's some reason why they want to commune with bears in their backyard, but that's all good. It's okay. I'll take the gang members over a bear any old day, you know? And it says, I beg you as sojourners, those that temporarily go, and pilgrims, and, and pilgrims, are, are the definition of that is that is a person that journeys to a foreign land for a purpose. And so even though we're not going off to foreign lands, when we leave the confines of this building right here, this church, we are pilgrims now. We're, we're on a pilgrimage to somewhere. 
a foreign place that's not our comfortable pews. Are they comfortable? I don't really sit in those things. Are they relatively comfortable? Okay, good. This, this is pretty good, too. And we travel to these places for a purpose. And the purpose is the, the fill-in, serving for them to see Jesus. That's why we do this, man, so that they can get... That's one of the biggest reasons we do what we do. The whole thing's been put together the way it's been put together, so that they can see Jesus from just a slightly different angle. Not necessarily the full-blown, you know, grab the Bible, shove it down their throat, pull it out their butt, and make sure they're all clean inside, right? That rarely works, man. It always gets hung up on something in there. And check this out. It's not our job, amen? Our job is to introduce them to the great plumber, Jesus Christ. I know you've probably never thought of him that way, but Jesus has a way of cleaning all the stuff out, man. It's just the way he does it. But look what he says here. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, those people that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God on the day of visitation. They may have a lot of preconceived notions about Christians and not want anything to do with them. You can, a lot of times when people are coming up and we're talking to people, even out in the world, not just the booth, you can kind of get that sense that someone is already kind of got some animosity going on right there, man. And, and it, it can be very tense. And you know what? Check this out. It's super important that we understand that's not necessarily against us unless you've done something. It's, it's against their impression of Christianity for any number of reasons. They probably were hurt somewhere along the line. Who knows what their reason is? If, if, it, if you take it personal right off the bat, then you're going to lock up, man, and it's going to be really awkward. But the second you can be like, you know what, Lord? Just let me be me right now. And all the joy that I have in my salvation, just let that shine out right now. And you can just watch all that trepidation melt away. How was that? Trepidation. Trepidation. Yeah, wasn't that impressive? Still a good word, though, don't you think? Anyway, the idea is that the day that that moment happens for them, they decide through whatever means it is to give Jesus a chance to to give their life to Christ that day of visitation, they can think back on that stuff and go, you know what, I remember that I had a real problem with Christianity, and I'm here to tell you, I had a big problem with Christianity before Christ, and I have all my reasons for that too. But I met a bunch of weirdos. For me, it was out at Set Free on a ranch, and they were a weird bunch out there, amen? But because of the love they had for me, the acceptance when I came in there, expecting that I was going to be treated like some kind of, you know, debilitated, brain-melted freak or something like that, that they were going to coddle and wrap with blankets and wipe slobber. Didn't work out that way, man. They threw me a rake and said, hey, man, get out there and rake rocks in nice little rows. And I'm like, what? And like, do it unto Jesus, brother. And they loved me through some pretty dark times in my life. And you know what? That's the stuff that I remember seeing. Not the junk before. Not the judgment and stuff that I'd, I'd gotten in, you know, at other places and through other believers. It was those people that were just as messed up as I was, yet they had a joy about them that was freakish to me. Because we were eating beans and rice and Jesus Christ, man. And we were sleeping in some filthy garages, sometimes on the dirt. Yet they were all happy about it, man. And it took me a little while to understand why they were happy about it. We were, we were in the presence of the Holy Spirit out there. And all of a sudden, what used to be like, uh, I, couldn't, I could never be uh, content. When I was out there after a while, it didn't really matter because everything was beautiful out there. It was just a really weird trip. Well, the same thing happens with these people. I, I promise you tonight, there's people probably right now looking at their, their roadhouse water, their whatever, their little, their little refrigerator clips and stuff like that, and they're probably going, those people were really a trip. They may not you know, put it all together in their head right now, but we certainly did something here out there. We've done it at Quaid. We've done it at the markets and stuff like that, that people can look back on the day and go, man, that is not what I expected. And that's... That's some hardcore seed planting right there. Check out Romans with me real quick. This is a real famous verse. We've done a lot here, but it speaks to what we're talking about. Letting them see Jesus. Letting them see Jesus. Check it out. Letting them see Jesus, not me. Even though I'm there, you're there. 
when, when it's all about Jesus, just like we have like the bumper stickers, it's all about Jesus, or we have a t-shirt or something like that, sometimes it's not really all about Jesus, is it? Sometimes it's about us, and we, we kind of like, it's like a competition, man, that we're having sometimes, how many people are going to get saved. Sometimes we want to come across as really spiritual, really knowledgeable, really, really, really whatever. When it's all about Jesus, this is what happens. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren and sistren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We, How many of you have presented your bodies as living sacrifices to things other than God. I mean, you remember those days when uh, we've allowed things to happen in our lives or whatever, you know, we, we put ourselves in positions and things like that. You know, I understand, you know, before Christ, we, we didn't know any better. Well, I would say we didn't know any better because we knew we were, stuff that we were doing wrong. But he's saying now, use that same energy. You remember the energy for you tweakers that you would put into chasing a bag around for hours and hours and hours. What if you put half of that energy in serving God? Just half of that motivation, that drive, that willingness to walk through fire, go through flood, floods, fires, whatever, just to get that little bag. What if we took just some of that energy and said, you know what, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in just presenting you out there to the world. Not me. Just move me aside and let them see you. And he goes like this, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As soon as we stop trying to fit into the world's narrative of what we should be, how we should be, what we should say, how we should act, this and that, all that, you know, the the goofy stuff that we, well, we don't know if we should do this anymore. We don't know if we should do that. Hey, you know what? If the word says do it, you know what I say? Council culture can kiss um, the hand of God and get saved by him and give their life to him. How about that? Is that better? You know what? If God's word says go and, and be fruitful, if God's word says go and, and, and make uh, disciples of the nations, who out there can tell us, no, you can't do that. We're canceling that from here on out. It, it's not going to happen, man. I, I know that there's people that want to do that. They want to stop all that. Don't allow your flesh to get in the way and get pissed off about that. Just praise God and continue being you in Christ. And let Dad handle all that junk, amen? Because he will handle it just dandy, amen? Probably a lot better than most of us will handle it, right? Here's the second one, serving the community you were called to. Super important, man. You know, serving what we were. Now, we were obviously called to bikers here at the very beginning of this ministry. We were, it was predominantly all bikers. And in fact, even at the very beginning of the Bible study, there weren't even any women around. And it wasn't like because I didn't want women at the Bible studies. I think it was the sign on the door that said no women allowed. I think. We're having a, a meeting of the He-Man Woman Haters Club of America. So, no, it was, uh, that kind of came a little bit later on. And then, you know, people started coming and more people started coming. And then here we are, you know, we're the roadhouse right, as we are right now. But the community was predominantly to bikers. And we were doing a whole lot of events and things like that. And, and back in those days, a lot of us were riding like every day. We didn't even drive cars or anything like that. And we rode and rode and rode. And just so you know, when you ride that much, the percentage of something bad happening goes up exponentially, all right? It's just the, the game of percentages. And, you know, one or two of us um, encountered, you know, rapid deceleration injuries and things of that nature, you know, short flight destination, ugh, all that stuff, you know? And as a result, some of our bodies, although we, we want to offer them as living sacrifices, just can't keep up as much as they used to be able to keep up, amen? But we're still plugging along, right? We're still there. Look at Matthew with me real quick. This is serving the community you are called to. Now, that's just not the biker community, just so you know, because as you know, a huge portion of our church are cagers, right? How many cagers for Christ do we have in here? Amen? All right, that's all. Praise the Lord, amen? We, we love you cagers too, because you know what? I'm a cager. I'm, I'm more of a cager than a writer these days, but we're working on that, Amen? Um, for those of you that are um, have accelerated age at this point, you know, um, 
I just want to share something with you. No matter how cool it looks, abstain from lowering kits on your motorcycles. <laughs> Amen? It don't work well after 50. Just food for thought, all right? Personal experience there. So let's look at what Jesus says about this community thing over here in Matthew, another famous verse. You are the salt of the earth. And I love this positive, it's kind of a positive negative. It's kind of a positive this, but hey, don't do, you know, be careful of this one over here. You're the salt of the earth. He says you are the salt of the earth. Not that you might be the salt of the earth, but you are the salt of the earth. You are something that brings flavor. You're something that brings joy. You're something that excites something that might be somewhat mediocre. You are something that preserves, man. You're something that's important to life itself, man, being alive. When you think of us, as, think of Christianity in those terms, the salt of the earth is a super big calling all on its own. He says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Once we, we kind of put our own narrative on there, and it starts losing the flavor of Jesus, man, starts losing the flavor of the Holy Spirit and starts taking on the flavor of Denver, right? Before Christ, it was more like Danny than Denver. And you know what? Denver's way better than Danny, amen? Because Denver has been, is the salt of the earth. That's what God's called me. Just like each and every one of you can say your name, I am the salt of the earth. It's not a matter of you're going to be, although unless you, you know, you're coming to Christ, I understand that. But understand that he transformed you into something exceptionally good and necessary for this world, for that lost and broken world. You're something that they desire, that they, they, they're, they're sought after. Like if you have a good steak, don't you want to put some salt on that sucker? A little salt and pepper, man, brings out all the flavor and that stuff. It's not the steak wasn't good in the first place. But there's something about salt that just makes it better. Well, that's how life is. Not necessarily life isn't all that bad, although probably some of it is. But with a little bit of seasoning on there and the right kind of seasoning, the, the JC seasoning. Well, was there a barbecue sauce called that? Like KC and the Sunshine Band barbecue or something? Anyway, I remember something like that. Check out verse 14. You are the light of the world. And again, look at the way it's written out. It's not you're, you're kind of the light. You're a dim light. You know, you're a fluorescent light. You're a black light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world because of the blood of Christ within us. He says, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. That's what happened today. That light was put on a lampstand. It was a big old lampstand called Arrowhead Village up there. Amen. And it shined out. and People could see it from all directions, man. There was a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of cool cars. There was a lot of car guys that I knew back when I was building hot rods that I hadn't seen for a long, long time. We got to talk and chit-chat a little bit. But even if you looked down the row or you looked out in the parking lot, you still saw faces looking over at the laughter. There was something happening and it was that light that he's talking about right there. And it's kind of like if you're like in a dark room, like a pitch black room, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And someone way over in the corner lights one little match. You know what you're going to see? That match over there in the corner. Because light penetrates darkness, man. And even though we had a dark year last year, I'm here to tell you, each and every one of you are little match heads for Jesus, man. Just little flaming flame heads okay anyway <laughs> and since you are he says let your light so shine before men do it <clears throat> let let them see all this stuff but why what's the point of it he says that they may see the see your good works and glorify your father in heaven not glorify us Go, wow, man, those people are super cool, or that person is cool, or that person, man, they, sh they could sure pray. It's all about giving the glory to God, because it's God that's going to be there. Remember on that day of visitation right there? We might not even be around when that day happens. It might be a week down the road, or a year, or two, or ten years, who knows? But if they remember that light that they saw, that's what's going to be a spark for them when that moment comes. They're going to remember, and I promise you, there's people that were out there today they're going to remember amen look over at psalm 109 this is kind of the why behind all this stuff 
Psalm 109. Uh, the whole chapter is good, but let's go to 27. For like the exclamation point on this. That they may know that this is your hand, speaking of God, that you, Lord, have done it. That they've encountered, they've had a close encounter of the godly kind. That something happened that they did not expect when they got up this morning. They're going up to a car show, and, you know, it's going to be at the lake. It's going to be cool, and praise the Lord, there wasn't thunderstorms, you know, and hail and stuff coming down. And they were going up there to check out all the hot rods, and there were some fine cars up there, I might add. But God showed up, man. God showed up in the path of a, a lot of people, man. I, and again, I don't know what the numbers are. It's not that that's really important, but there was a lot of people that weren't expecting what happened up there. And you know what? I believe that they all know that it was God's hand. That, and, and you know, there was people that came up there, and they were talking to a few, a few of us that were, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't say go as far as they were baffled, but they were certainly intrigued by the fact that they got something heavy going on in their life, man, and they jumped in their car, their bike, whatever it was, and they rode up to this car show, you know, to get a little break from all the stuff, and they walked head first into the sovereignty of God. And they knew something was happening, man, when they ran into these, and, and God put just the right person at the prayer, that it, the connections were incredible today, and you could see it all over their faces. You know, I, I spoke to a fella that... Um, his uh, daughter was the best friends of those two kids that got shot in Corona in that theater. And, and apparently the, the guy passed away this morning from his, his gunshot wound. Well, his daughter, he just, like this morning, she came out of the room all emotional. He's like, hey, what's up? And he told her what was happening. And that guy was, was clearly wrecked by it, man, to see his daughter. And I know that he knows the kids. They were all best friends. It was just a really tough thing, that, a burden that he was carrying from wherever he lived up that mountain. He was just kind of, I wouldn't say he was shaking it off, but he was kind of going up there to hang out with his buddy. And he saw us, and he went through the whole thing. And, and I think it was Amy asked him if he wanted prayer. And man, his world got rocked right there, man, because all of a sudden God showed up in his life. He might have been thinking about God. I don't really know. I don't know anything about the guy because I don't know him. But clearly, man, his knees were getting wobbly. He was having a close encounter with God up there on that mountain. And it was, it was a very emotional prayer to spend some time with that guy. He didn't expect it. That's what I'm talking about here, man. That they may know that it was your hand that you, Lord, have done it. And I, I'm trying to let you guys know the impact you have on people's lives. You have no idea whether it's at a market or a gas station or the post office, at a doctor's office, anywhere, man. You don't know what people are going through. And then you have a conversation that leads into a part where, like, can I pray with you? And all of a sudden, like, man, you know what? This is going on. And they all of a sudden, they just, like, pour it out to you right there. And they realize, I don't know if they realize at the moment, but they will at some point realize that God orchestrated that whole thing that you and them were in that same room at that same second out of all the time that this whole world has ever existed that that moment in time happened just for them and man it can be very profound I'm telling you it's stuff that people won't forget very soon where the heck am I oh first Peter go with me over to first Peter real quick first Peter 3 first Peter 3 uh, 15 but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts First and foremost, set apart God in your heart. What does that mean to sanctify God, to set him apart? Man, our hearts are filled with all kinds of stuff, man. Our brains are filled with stuff. Our hearts are filled with stuff. There's good, there's bad, there's happiness, there's sadness, there's rage, there's all kinds of stuff, man. But when we can set apart God right here, now you got all that stuff, it ain't going to go away, man, because it's part of our life. But when we can set apart God, he says like this, sanctify the Lord Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give it events to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's going to be really hard to give a defense. What that basically means is to talk to someone about your hope, the hope that's in you. It's going to be really hard if your heart is just black, man, because you've just allowed, not even allowed, but you've just been smothered by the world for so long. You just, it's almost you don't have that little spot for God that you can set aside and just be 
a servant to him. But when we can do that, we can set that little part aside right there and tell them, this is the hope I have in God. Now, now that hope may be a little hope, but you know what? A little hope goes a long way with God, amen? And that little bit of hope can just flood that whole heart. And for those people out there that have zero hope, that little bit of hope that you've set aside right there to give away, it, it's, it's something you're, you're willingly going to give away. And you say, this hope right here, this is the hope I have in the Lord. This is all Jesus right here, and I give this to you. That doesn't mean you're, you're going to be hopeless because you're not, obviously. But for that person, that tiny little, that t- sometimes, man, it's the littlest, tiniest little hope that you might think even is insignificant. But for someone out there that's absolutely drowning in their world, that tiny little hope is a life preserver, man, that might be the one thing that helps get them up and out of that pool, the whirlpool that they're being sucked down into. But we have to actively go, all right, Lord, you know what? Everything's going wrong right now. I mean, there's just so much happening in my life right now. But you know what? I have purpose in my heart to serve you. And I have purpose in my heart that I want them to see you, not me. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this stuff over here. And I'm going to sanctify this one spot right there. And Lord, if, if you have any divine appointments for me, boom, that's the spot I'm going to right there. I'm not going to dump all my stuff out. I'm just going to, today, I'm going to give you away. And man, will he run with that. I mean, talk about just, just cracking the door a little bit for dad. He can work so much with so little. Just a, a mustard seed of faith. Just the tiniest little amount of faith. And man, he could, he could take off with that thing, man. Check this out. The, uh, the last one here is serving our way in one seed at a time. And I'm going to tell you what, in an event like today, you really got to focus. Because man, people, okay, I don't want to be like, you know, what's the word here? Boastful, all right? But there was other booths out there, and I'm sure they had some cool stuff, you know, like that. But there were no booths that had big old lines that were going out and curving and going up the dang road, man. People were literally waiting in the sun to get up to the booth. Now, I don't think we have that much high-value stuff that we're giving away at the booth, man, for people to wait for 20 minutes before they get up to the spinner. The value that they saw and they sought after and they desired and wanted was that happiness I'm telling you guys about. They saw something going on there, man, and they just wanted a little piece of it. That's what's going on in the world. People are starving for a little happiness and joy, man, and you guys are filled to the top with it right now. All we have to do is go out and talk to people, man, and I and you'll see things happen, and maybe some of you already have, but look at Hosea. It's like one of my, you know, my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I've used this one for many, many years. Sell for yourselves righteousness. I love the first part of that right off the bat. We're talking about serving, right? Serving others. What about you? How about your joy and your happiness? Where's that at? And what is the, what's the... Uh, Who's your dealer? <laughs> Probably not the best way to go about that one. Um, who's your supplier? No, not even good. Uh, your provider? Does that work better? Okay. So for yourselves, righteousness. Right, right before we even move any further, how are you with God, man? How are you with trusting dad with stuff that's going on in your life? How are you a trusting dad on everything that went on with COVID and everything that's going to happen from here on out all the way till we get raptured out of here? Where are you really at with God? Are you really, really believing on him? Are you kind of believing on him? Are you like half and half right now? You're still kind of, yeah, you know, I trust him in a lot of areas in my life and I do. But, you know, when it when it like comes to my finances, I, it's probably better if I just manage that one myself. Or my kids, you know, it's not that I don't, Love God is not that I don't trust him, but, you know, that's my kid, and I think I should probably manage that. My grandchildren. Look, man, when, when, we, when, we, when we're looking at things that way, we're looking at it from a worldly perspective. Because there's, there's things like you might not necessarily be too concerned about trusting, you know, God, but like, for instance, taking the trash out. 
You know, this one I think I can do on my own, Lord. I'm going to go ahead. I wouldn't, as and I don't necessarily pray on when I take the trash out because I generally don't. But that's another Bible study. When I'm mowing the lawn, though, I don't go out there and pray. Actually, I don't mow the lawn either. Let me find something I do. Um, oh, I know. Um, when I'm taking somebody's bike apart in my garage, I don't generally pray over it, which is probably not what he wants to hear right now. But yeah, I, I just go do that sort of thing. But you know what? When it comes to my children and my grandchildren, I pray hard for them, man. And I give them to God because it's not that I don't think I can handle it and I don't think I can make decisions because I make a lot of decisions and I handle things just well. But I want to know for a fact that my kids are in the capable hands of God. Amen. And my grandchildren are in God's hands. So I lay them on his throne, man. And the thing is, if, if we kind of pull back on stuff like that and, and we're not trusting him in any area of our life, how can we honestly say we trust him completely? Because we, we really don't, right? So look at this. He says, sow for yourselves righteousness. First thing, sow some seeds of love and trust and honor and obedience to God in our own lives, man. Do a little bit of gardening in our own heart, man. You know, do a little plowing in there and pull out, what, you know, some weeds. And sow for yourself some rightness with God. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, you know, being robotic about this. I'm talking about a relationship, man. Not a religion at all, man. I'm talking about a relationship between you and your Father, you and Jesus Christ. Because this leads us into the next thing. Because he says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Because if we're still harboring stuff in our hearts about certain people and things like that, we might, we might be inclined to pick and choose. You know, we might be inclined to look at that crowd out there and go, eh, you know, don't necessarily, you know, go out of your way to give that one a seed card or a spinner card right now. You know, you know go, down, go down the other end down there. Those people look, you know, way friendlier or whatever. When we reap in mercy, everybody's on the board, man everybody's in play, no matter who they are, what they are, what they look like, what they rode, what they didn't ride, what they drove. It doesn't matter because our hearts are now about giving and serving unto God, not unto ourselves. So we're not picking and choosing stuff. And he goes, break up your fallow ground. That's that ground that you plowed. That's what fallow ground is. Fallow ground is that, that North 40 that uh, Mark and the rifleman, Lucas, already plowed like, you know, last summer or something like that. And then they went and they worked on this area over there. Well, that's already been plowed, but it's kind of not really, it's kind of hardened down with weather and stuff like that, rains and stuff. So you can't just go out and spread seed because it's kind of hard on top. So you got to go out and break that up. You don't have to work as hard. You're not going to pull all the stumps and move all the rocks. That already happened over there. We've already done that. We've removed a lot of rocks and stumps in our lives, right? We've already gone and, and made some changes. How many of you are still tweaking pretty hard on speed right now that you haven't quite given it all up yet? Anybody in here? Nobody wants to raise their hand. Okay, how many full-blown alcoholics are still going at it right now? Anybody in here? How about, uh, I don't know, bank robbers? Anybody robbing banks, liquor stores, stuff? Okay, one, one here, two. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah, and I have that on video right now, so for... Uh, a nominal fee of $100, I can have that edited out. But that's up to you. We'll talk about it after church tonight. So you've already done some work, right? And then we move on with life. You know, we get saved and we, you know, we make some changes. We, 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 do, we do things that, as the Lord prompts us to change some stuff in our life, right? Well, now he's saying, okay, you know what? That ground is super valuable, man. That was, that was the honeymoon ground back there, man. That's when it all started. That's when you were on fire. Remember, remember the days when you were on fire for the Lord when you first got saved, man? And you go chasing cars down the street, man. They'd roll up. Well, I did anyway. They'd roll up their windows and lock their doors. And I'm like, I just want to tell you about Jesus. They're like, ah! And they go take off, man. That was at Sterling and Baseline. Probably not the best area to be chasing cars down. But nonetheless, I was a baby Christian. Well, all that fallow ground was about having a heart for God, man, having a heart to share Jesus, man, just on fire for him. He said, now, now's the time. Go break that up, man. Go break up that ground. Get it alive again. Reignite that fire. And he goes, for it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. 
He's saying, go tear that ground up right there and get ready for a harvest, man, because some stuff is going to start springing up out of that ground right there, and he's going to rain all that righteousness down on you, man, and you are going to reap a bomb harvest out of it. But sometimes we forget about that fallowed ground. We forget about those early days when we were plowing like madmen, man, and we were taking rocks and chucking them right and left. And Man, we didn't even blow up trees. We just ran them over, man, and we had this beautiful field. And he's like, okay, that's good. Now I need you to go over here. I need you to serve with the children. All right, I need you to go over here. I need you to serve in the music. And she's like, okay, okay. And that ground kind of just levels out and just kind of gets a little bit hard on top there. There's nothing wrong with it, man, and there's nothing wrong with any of your fallowed ground. The stuff that you plowed in the early days, it's still there, it's still good, and it's ready, man. It's ready for you to just stick the plow in the ground. And like the song says, hey, my, what's it say? My, none, nothing's going to happen without dirt on the plow or something? I don't even know the song and I wrote it. But anyway, <laughs> basically, paraphrase is, if you don't stick the plow in the dirt, it ain't going to get dirty, right? You're going to have a nice, clean plow on the wall, and your friends come over and be like, hey, check out my nice, clean plow. And I'm like, dang, that's a nice, clean plow. Yeah, I've had it for like 10 years, man. It's never, ever seen the dirt yet. What the heck, man? You buy a plow, you know, you know the best plows out there are the ones that are all dented and the blades all dull and bent and stuff like that because they've been banging into rocks and all kinds of stuff. Those are the best plows. And the best, best plow hands are the ones that are all blistered, man. Because you've been in the, out there in the field doing it, man. Um, you know what? We're just getting started this year. There's a lot of stuff going to be happening. Lots of different things. Not just events like that. And I encourage you guys, just give Jesus a chance, man, and jump in. Just jump in and see for yourself. Look at, look at Isaiah with me real quick here. Look over at Isaiah something. We're in like 17 because I just turned to it right now, but I don't think that's where we're going. Ah, 28. Okay, here's a good one. Does the plowman keep plowing all day long to sow? No. If you keep plowing all day and 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 definitely, when are you going to sow the seed, right? He says, does he keep plowing all day? No. Does he keep turning the soil and breaking the clods? No. We've done that already. That's already been done. There's no need to go back and do it again and do it again and do it again. It says, when he has a love, when he has leveled his surface, does he not sow black cumin? Does he not scatter the cumin, plant wheat in rows, the barley in appropriate place, the spelt in its place? Look, there's so much ministry opportunity out there. I mean, it's everywhere, everywhere in your lives. There's ministry opportunity everywhere. And even more so for us than these guys here or even people 25, 30 years ago, because they didn't have the internet. We have the internet. We can actually get on Facebook and say nice things to people. We don't have to be ugly all the time. We don't have to be trolls. We can actually be nice and godly on that stuff and, and reach out to people that we can't. It used to be you had to get on the phone, and even for some of you younger people, the phone was actually hooked to the wall, and it had a cord, <laughs> and then you had to like go, And you had to dial a thing called a dial, a rotary dial. Yeah, when if you were like, you know, well off, you like, boop, 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 boop. and you had a little thing called a keypad, and you would dial a series of numbers. Man, can you imagine what we're going to be doing 25 years from today, this day? What technology is going to look like? There's going to be like, um, what are those things where they like pop up in front of you? Um, holographic stuff. You're going to call someone up on the phone and you'd be like, and they're like, hello. And they're like all asleep. And you're like, hey, what's going on? It'd be like this hologram of them like snoozing out or God knows whatever, you know, you probably want to be careful before you hit you like answer on that thing. Yeah, that could be awkward, right? You're like in the shower. You're like, yeah, hello. You're like, oh, and like the whole church there. Happy birthday. Just wanted to say hi. And there you are in all your glory in the shower, right? Okay, yeah, we're going to need some filters on that stuff, don't you think? But here's the best part of all that. Well, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know when to talk to the cumin. I don't know when I'm supposed to talk to the wheat. I don't know how I'm even supposed to talk to the barley. I mean, it's easy to read in the Bible. Well, verse 26 said, For he instructs him in right judgment. He, God, instructs him. His God teaches him, don't panic. 
God's got it all figured out, man. He already knows who he wants you to talk to. He even knows where he wants you to talk to. In fact, it's already established right now. For all of you in this room, he's got divine appointments. He'll instruct you. Don't freak out, man. I've told you guys over and over, you have more knowledge in your hearts and your minds than you give yourself credit for, man. If, you're just, if you just stop thinking so hard and just let your heart do the stuff, just let God have his way, make room for the Holy Spirit, He'll handle this stuff, man. I'm telling you, trust God. Don't trust me, man, but trust Jesus. He's never going to let you down. Has he ever let you down yet? No. Okay, look at the last one today. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 9, 6, and 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This, this ain't rocket science here, man. If, if you throw a seed out in there and expect a, a whole 10 acres of corn to grow, you're probably going to be really disappointed in what comes out of that one little seed. But check this out. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Does that, you know, if you, if you scatter, you know, seed like we're doing, like when we're talking about praying with people and going out and speaking with them, do you think that when a farmer scatters a bunch of seeds in the field that every single one of those seeds grows? Probably not. I don't even know what the percentage of it is. But is that for us to know? Is this not God's providence to do? He's the one that brings the increase. He's the one that's going to raise the stuff up. He never called us to count heads, you know, and, and count sheep. Well, some of us are expected to kind of keep track of the sheep for the most part, you know, but... Um, and I try for the most part. Some, you know. Anyway, that's another Bible study. So back to what we were talking about here. He's talking about sowing bountifully and reaping bountifully. The more you give of yourself, the more you're going to receive back in the harvest. Like today, like some of the other things we did, the happy tour is going to be coming up there, man. You know what? If you get out there and just cut loose, man, and be happy, you might be surprised at just how effective you are out there in that world the second you pull that stick out and stop thinking that I got to do it this way, I got to do it that way, I got to be just perfect, I got to line this up, and I got to paint, I got to color inside the lines. Hey, man, you know what? Sometimes I think when it comes to outreach and, and sharing our faith and talking, it's more abstract art than paint by number. Just get out there and let the Holy Spirit do his thing. Just let the love flow like a mountain stream. Let, the, let your love flow. I, I forgot the rest of it. Dang it, I need the words. I hate when that happens, man. Well, anyway, look at what it says here. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. This is important now. Some people have a heart for ministry. Some people don't. Some people have a heart for the lost, and they have a burden for the lost. Some people don't. All right, but... I'm going to tell you right now that if you're shortchanged, if, if, you, if you kind of feel like that's somebody else's ministry or somebody else's job, you're shortchanging yourself out of a lot of joy and a ton of happiness, man. And not to mention just some really, really good times that you can't get doing the things that we used to do. You can't achieve that level of happiness and joy because, again, there's no drugs known to man that can put you at that level, at that place. Only the blood of Christ, man. And the only way that's going to happen is to be a kingdom kid, man. To be one of God's children, that royal priesthood, that holy nation, man. Then you'll understand this stuff. But, he says, let each one, as he purposes his heart, not grudgingly. Oh, great, now i got to go do another outreach. i got to go talk to another broken lost soul out there oh boy hey you know you can be that way if you choose to but remember what you sow is what you reap and if you're sowing sparingly don't be whining at god because things aren't all that spectacular in your life all right maybe maybe he's trying to get your attention sometimes but you know what we do that too you know when life's good and like oh god is great when life's bad god hates me you know but this thing's talking about 
grudgingly or out of necessity. Like I want, like I'm, I'm making you go. I'm not making anybody go anywhere. In fact, if you don't want to go, don't go. You're probably going to be a bigger pain in my butt than you are if you don't. All right, if you do go. But I'm encouraging you guys. Take a second to just be willing. To go let them see Jesus, not you. Move, move yourself aside. I know it's hard to do sometimes. Move yourself aside and go out and be that cheerful giver. He talks about it right here in a second. That one that's just all about letting them see Jesus, man. Well, like, I don't know if they even see Jesus in me. Yes, they will. If you allow them to, if you're willing to take, down, take your mask off, and I don't mean the goofy ones that we've been having to wear for you know, corroded 19 and all that madness. I'm talking about the masks that people still wear, and particularly Christians, the the whole Christian-y stuff, man. You know what? Some of it's really cool. Some of it's really polished, and some of you are, are like a bumper sticker factory. You can rattle those things off, but I'm here to tell you that I think you're way more interesting without all that junk. I think you're way more unique and way more interesting, and I would prefer that you just be the weirdest you that you need to be and put all that junk aside because to be totally honest with you, it doesn't impress me at all and it doesn't impress the people around you. So that only leaves one person that's being impressed by it and that's the person you're staring at in the mirror. I'm just not trying to be mean. That was rather mean, wasn't it? Did it seem mean right now? Okay, well, praise the Lord. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to help you guys understand something. You don't have to put on all that junk, man, because the fact is everybody can see right through it because that's the crazy thing about Christianese. It's transparent. You might think that, you know, people might think they're putting up this big old facade and they're kind of playing this big old charade. That's the French version of charade, just so you know. The charade. But everybody can see right through it, man. It's way more effective when uniquely you are just genuine, man. Just be who you are in Christ. I promise you, you are perfect. Just the way God wants you to be. Does that mean you're going to be this way forever? Prayfully not, right? Hopefully we're going to kind of continue moving on. And who knows? Maybe some of the screws and plates will pop out. I don't know. How awkward would that be? If all of a sudden all the screws in my body just popped out right during the middle of a Bible study. Like a, be like a claymore mine is what it would be like. <laughs> okay, I wouldn't do that to you guys. Look what he says here. For God loves the cheerful giver. In all the ways God loves the cheerful giver. In ministry, in, in loving, in hope, in giving, in tithing, in everything. God has a way of blessing your socks off because you can't outgive God in anything. And you know what? I encourage you to try. It's fun to try to outgive God because it becomes a fun little thing that He likes to do with you. And man, you start thinking, man, I am getting the upper hand on God here. I am really sewing into this whole thing. And then boom, Billy Graham shows up. Well, probably not Billy. <laughs> that would be cool, you know, wouldn't it? Yeah, hey. And a quick note on that, those that stuff, I think it's on your bulletin, the addresses, shoot them an email, man, and go, hey, you know what, Franklin would really dig this cool little church. It's like a mile away from where he's going to be doing his thing. He is welcome to come on over here. We would love to have Franklin come over and check out our church and pray over our church, man. And you know what, Franklin is the kind of guy that will do it. Because he's popped into other churches. In fact, one right down there in Oceanside, he's hanging out in all the time. He popped in right down there just to hang out because he had something going on. He is a super down-to-earth, cool guy, man. If you want to meet Franklin, I'm not saying it'll happen. I'm just saying shoot some emails to wherever that thing is right there, and you might be surprised if Franklin just stops in one day. And you know what he'll do? He'll sit down in a pew. He'll sit down in a chair. He is the coolest, most down-to-earth guy you can imagine. But there is a, just like his daddy, man, there is something about that dude, man. There is just like a brrr thing going on with him. I don't know if brrr is the right word or brrr might be a better tone, might be a beep, 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 beep. I don't know what it is. There's an emanation, an emanation. Oh, I want to tell you guys what Pat did today, but I don't know if I should. I'm, in fact, I'm not going to. You know what? I, you want me to? Seriously? 
So we're unloading the trailer and we have the door open. Now some of you have probably experienced this, it's probably not totally appropriate for right now, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. And we're getting all the stuff out of Belk. Just me and Patrick, we're working on getting that stuff out. He's taking it out and I'm picking it up and I'm sitting down. And he reaches in and, and grabs the stuff and blew a big old burnt right in my face. And I'm like, dude. And this guy was walking by and he goes, wow, it sounds good since you tuned it up. And I'm like, dude, we're unloading the battle wagon, man. Well, at least like a, you know, squeeze a little and make it like a silent but deadly, but it, I mean, it was like, it's not like a shofar, man, on the freaking mountain up there. And I was like, right there. Okay, I'm back. I feel so much better by sharing that. I feel like I've, I've, something's been lifted off of my shoulder. Anyway. Huh? Just food for thought, all right? If you ever work with Pat, beware the back door, okay? Okay, anyway, but praise the Lord. Pat was rocking it up there today, man. He was really in his element. I wish I could have got some of that on video. He was just pinging around there, man. It was, uh, it was something to see. Anyway, toward you, let's try to bring this back home now. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that... You always have an all-sufficiency in all things. You can't outgive God. That's what this is saying right there. God's going to pour grace upon you, man. You can try to outgive Him, out, out pray with the people, out give with people, out hope the people, out tithe the church. I double dog dare you to try it. God will always outgive you. And not only that, it says that He's going to, that grace is going to abound towards you always, that you'll have all things. Sufficiency, the sufficiency. Don't go thinking you're going to get a Cadillac out of the deal unless he wants to give you one. All sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. You'll, you'll never be lacking in what you need to serve God, ever. You'll never be able to outgive God in ministry and just serve him. So check this out. Here's the, here's the application for tonight. And, and just so you know, this stuff all came together. This, this series started weeks ago before I even knew we were going up on that mountain. And Dad had something to say to all of us tonight. And, for, and from, from my heart to yours, all of you up here, thank you so much for going up there and representing Jesus so well on that mountain. Bravo to you. Amen. If not a matter of, it's not a matter of if, but when you will have spiritual conversations. When we combine service and prayer, God's face is almost always created instantaneously. And that's what happened. The happy tour is coming. I encourage you guys to jump in. It's just all about going out and being happy and praying with people, man, and sharing some love out there in a lost and broken world. We're going to have a lot of events coming up, but remember, as we've been talking about, every day of your life you encounter people somewhere in the course of your day. Just let your love flow, amen? Just give it a chance, amen? Check this out. We're going to pray out right now. Father, we thank you for this day. It was a miraculous day. There was some cool stuff that happened, and we thank you that you let us participate in that. We, let, we thank you you let us participate in that, that little piece of your kingdom up there today. And all those that were touched, Father, we were blessed, Father, and we thank you for blessing our socks off. And our desire is that everybody understands what that blessing thing's all about, and it's about having a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, as we pray now, Father, I ask that you, you speak to hearts in this room, speak to hearts out there in video land, Father, that if there's even one soul out there, Father, that's feeling that tugging on their heart, just something happy happening right now, that this is their moment. As we pray, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to have his way in Jesus' name. Let's all pray. Father God, I've sinned against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. Amen. It's in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord some praise. He's awesome. It was a beautiful day and the day ain't over yet. Amen. We still got a whole day to praise the Lord. Amen. Hey, you guys, I will see you next week. Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys.